The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Vision New England's monthly webinar series. We're excited that you carved out the time today to join us. We have a, a great uh, program in mind for you today, and we're prayerfully hoping that you get a lot out of it, and um, God just blesses our time together and helps us and encourages us to grow. Um, my name is Michael Froning, and I am the Marketing and Communications Director at Vision New England, and I'll be shepherding the process here. And um, we have a couple of quick logistics before I introduce our guest. A um, couple of questions or comments. I'm not sure how many of you have attended a, an event before, but we are, really want to make these webinars very interactive, and really we're here for you. So the idea is that um, we're very much in flux in terms of how the – uh, webinar goes and you have the ability to ask questions on the fly. Uh, so just a couple of quick uh, points to how you ask a question. There are a couple ways you can do it. You can type a very quick little chat comment in the chat box on the bottom and I'll be manning that throughout the presentation and we'll interject questions as we go. Or you can type out a formal question in the question box and um, that way we can have a queue of that and make sure they get answered in a timely fashion. So again, um, this is uh, a, an opportunity for you to learn and grow. So feel free to, to pop out those questions as soon as they come to mind. Um, we will also do our best to end right at 1245. And we'll have a, I guess, quote, quote, formal question and answer time as well at the very end. But again, I encourage you to wait, uh, not to wait until the end. Um, okay, well, without further ado, uh, why don't I introduce you to Keith Tolley. Keith will be leading our um, webinar today, and he is the lead consultant for Vision New England uh, in terms of pastoral mentoring and coaching, and as well as just leadership principles in general. So we're really excited to have Keith here. He's also a lead pastor in Greenfield, Massachusetts. So uh, Keith, welcome today. Mike, thanks so much. Can you hear me okay, Mike? I think we're good to go, yes. Okay, great. And uh, just a welcome to everybody who's here. Um, I, I thought I'd just jump right in uh, and uh, walk right into the materials. As, as we've been working with churches, um, I want to I wanna start here with this related to um, leadership structure and support systems and all of that. Um, by just making ha, sharing an observation, as as we've been working with these churches, we've continued to come across this, we'll call it a tension that seems to exist amongst some folks, um, whether it's unspoken or spoken, between what we'll call the organism or people side of the church and the organizational realities of the church, and when we're when talking about a church's need to put into place systems or processes or structures of some kind, we'll sometimes hear folks make statements like, well, why are we talking about these things? The church is not a business. Or the church is about helping uh, people, not about operating like a business. And while we fully agree that it's incredibly important that the ministries of a local church focus their attentions on helping and serving and caring for and equipping and loving on people. It's also important that the local church not lose sight of the organizational realities that come with their need to do these things effectively and biblically and lawfully. And let, let me just share an illustration of what we mean by this. And so at uh, most local churches were birthed when a group of people decided to come together on mission, uh, on mission to reach their communities with the love and message of Christ. And at, at some point in time, this particular group of people, even if they had been meeting in homes or whatever, uh, as they'd been meeting together and journeying together, they made a decision to covenant together to do some things. And let me just walk through some of these things that typically take place, and they made a decision at some point to incorporate, which included their decision to establish an agreed upon uh, set of bylaws and practices, which included their decision to become uh, a legal entity, in this case a 501c3, and which included that uh, for some churches that they actually become part of a denomination like the Four C's or some other denomination. And, and as they grew, 
they made a decision to hire paid employees, whether part-time or full-time, to purchase facilities and equipment and materials and technology and other things to help facilitate their ministry activities. And they made decisions to, to collect tithes and offerings from the people who are part of their church. As they grew, they may have expanded the number of ministry, ministries that they were involved in and that they and, and to support those and do those, they created various ministry teams. And then they, they decided also that they wanted to communicate with one another across the church, but as well as communicate with folks and the world outside of the church. And what these decisions did that this group made is they carried with them implications. For as a Christian community, these folks wanted to ensure that everything they did was in compliance with the biblical requirements and principles that God has defined for God's people, but as an organizational and legal entity, they also needed to ensure that they were in compliance with federal and state and local laws and regulations related to a number of areas such as employer-employee relationships, teacher-student relationships, operating and managing facilities, uh, governance requirements, uh, and others. And because they are a 501c3, this group of people who were on mission together, or covenant together, that they wanted to ensure that they followed the requirements and guidelines for managing finances within this kind of entity, and that they had to ensure that they provided safe and protected environments for their guests and for their children and for their employees. And they also decided that it was important for them to provide ongoing leadership and training and support and count coaching and resources for their staff, for their ministry personnel that uh, were part of the church family and their ministries. And what these things require in order for them to be done effectively and lawfully really is the development and implementation of some kind of support structure, a support structure that includes things like policies, processes, and people. And it's here that we find the intersection between the organism or people side of the church and the organizational realities of the church. So you have this group of people who were on mission together as they grew, they coveted it together and made decisions that led to the need to really look carefully at the organizational realities and structures within the church. And there is this need within the local church for uh, support structures that will help the church pursue their purpose and their mission, whatever they have to find that to be according to their defined guiding values, and that will also help them pursue their vision priorities, their vision goals, and their strategic ministry plan. Support structures that, as we mentioned before, will include descriptions and details related to the kind of policies and processes and personnel organizational structure that are needed in support of the church's ministry plan. So before we talk about um, church leadership structures and responsibilities, I think it's just important that we recognize that there, while there may be this tension between the organism people side of the church and the organizational realities of the church, it is something that every single local church uh, community really needs to explore and come to terms with. And this, especially as it relates to the leadership structure. So before I go any further, I just want to pause and ask if there's any questions, comments, or concerns about that kind of that tension, if you're seeing that tension, or um, you know, if, if you had any um, comments before I move forward. Any thoughts on that? Uh, anyone who's... At this point, no, but it, they might, it might take some time for people to type them in, Keith. So we'll give them a little time as you continue and I can break in. Does that make sense? That makes a ton of sense. Okay, so um, at Vision New England, we are currently using 
the Natural Church Development Church Health Assessment Survey to help churches understand where they are currently at in a number of critical areas of church body life. And one of the body life characteristics that NCD, or Natural Church Development, measures is called effective structures, effective structures. And let me just share with you how NCD defines what is being assessed within the category of effective structures. When they're talking about to what extent do the decision-making processes, operating procedures, uh, official or unofficial, and board and committee structures facilitate rather than hinder the fulfillment of our church's mission as well as the spiritual growth of the individuals and of the congregation. So this is the definition of effective structures that are being uh, assessed within the NCD survey. And one of the body life characteristics, or one of the most important support systems and structures within the local church is the one that addresses the need for leadership in the church. And so as we've come across um, and worked with a number of churches in New England, we've seen a number of different options for church leadership structure. So what I'm going to share with you is some of the options that we have seen out there from uh, at senior level of church leadership. There is what we call the single board structure, and it, it has options such as this. There's a council, and that council includes committee or team leaders and the senior pastor. We've also seen a structure that is uh, a board structure where there will be members at large, and they're not officially called elders. There will be a senior pastor, and some also include selected staff. We've seen structures where there's a board of elders and then the senior pastor is also on that board, but he's not or she's not considered an elder. We also see board structures that are uh, elders only. So it's a elders only board and that includes a senior pastor as an elder. We've seen board structures where there are elders there's other members at large, and there's the senior pastor. And we've seen board structures where there's elders, selected staff members, and uh, the senior pastor as well. In addition to single board senior leadership team options, we've also seen um, what we'll call multiple board leadership team options. And let me just share uh, a couple of those that we have seen. One is uh, there is the first board, or one of the boards, uh, is the elders and the senior pastor, and the second board is the ministry team or committee leaders or what some churches call deacons. So at the senior leadership level, you have two boards, elders and senior pastor, and then ministry team committee leaders or deacons. Uh, we've also seen three boards in one church or in a church's structure, and they looked something like this. There was a board where there was the, the governance authority, so the chair, the vice chair, the treasurer, and the secretary. And these, uh, this board um, was, it was co the compliance board for the, the, the local regu regulations or state regulations for a nonprofit. And then there was another board, which was the elder board, and then there was a third board, which was the ministry board. So we've seen single board options, double board options and even triple board options in churches across the, uh, New England. And I share all of this just to point out that across New England there are various options that are currently in place for who a church uh, has recognized as the senior leadership of the church. And what I'd like to suggest, I think what we'd like to suggest is that Really, before a church lands on any particular structure, they're going to want to have clarity around the responsibilities that they want their senior leadership team to have and to execute. It's one, it's one thing to try to build a structure. It's another thing to build a structure that is, helps facilitate predefined responsibilities that have been clearly defined and articulated and agreed upon um, by the congregation. So 
What I'd like to do is, I've shared some of the options that we see out there, but what I'd like to do now is, is share with you a suggested framework for what we believe are the critical responsibilities that any senior leadership team should be charged with, regardless of which option is cho chosen for how they're going to be structured. So these responsibilities we, we would contend um, are not tied to any particular structure and could work within any of these structures that we shared. So let me just take some time and just walk through these key responsibilities. Um, and I'll, I'll do it first at kind of an overview level, and then what we'll do, uh, what I'll do is we'll walk through and define and unpack these a little bit more detail. So um, the responsibilities and functions that we're recommending you consider for your senior leadership team are uh, there's three of them, and we call them. You can call them whatever you want, but what we call we call them guidance responsibility of guidance the responsibility of leadership, and the responsibility of accountability. And the way this happens, or how this happens, is by the leadership team exercising oversight, uh, ensuring that these things happen, and in some cases actually participating in guidance, leadership, or accountability. And one of the things that we are recommending, because these are, these are very important and deep responsibilities, is that the re senior leadership team retain the authority to delegate activities that might be required to successfully carry out these responsibilities. So what I'm going to show you now is I'm, gonna get, I'm going to spend just a little time um, defining for you some suggestions on what you might want to include in each of the guidance, leadership, and accountability responsibilities. So here we go. In terms of guidance, um, when we talk about guidance, we're suggesting that the senior leadership team, whoever that is, whatever that structure is, be responsible for overseeing, ensuring, and in some cases participating in the development of these things. The church's statement of faith, the church's narrative, congregational narrative, and that's just a term we use at Vision New England that includes the church's purpose or mission, the church's vision, and the guiding values for the church. Uh, the development of the strategic ministry plan to include tactics and goals and personnel and processes and policies, the church's annual budget, the church's governing policies and bylaws, and the church's leadership development process. So what we're suggesting that you consider for your senior leadership team is that one of their key responsibilities be in the area of guidance, overseeing, ensuring, and participating in the development of these kinds of significant activities at the church. The second responsibility that we talked about is leadership. And as part of the research that we have been doing, we spent some time studying what God has to say about the leadership of his people and the specific passages that we looked at included these particular passages, which I'm sure a number of you are familiar with. And one of the critical and common themes that we discovered as we were studying this is that one of the primary uh, duties that, that God has called his people, the, the leadership of his people to be involved in is the responsibility of shepherd leadership, shepherding them, providing shepherding leadership to God's people. And the specific shepherding duties or shepherding leadership duties that we see in these these passages that we looked at include things like leading, knowing, caring for, feeding, equipping, protecting, seeking after the sheep. Uh, clearly, we believe that God has called the leaders of his people, especially the senior leaders, to ensure that his people, who they are overseeing, are bi being biblically shepherded, and which means that whatever model or structure of leadership you come up with has to include the responsibility of shepherd leadership. 
And so when we talk about leadership, we divide leadership responsibilities into two categories, shepherding leadership and what we call strategic leadership. And under the shepherding re uh, leadership responsibilities, what we're saying is we're suggesting that your senior leadership team be responsible for overseeing, ensuring, and participating in these shepherding responsibilities, safeguarding the statement of faith, the doctrines of the church, um, shepherding the, bene the benevolent care, the pastoral care, the nurture and the comfort of the folks uh, in the congregation, the ongoing spiritual growth and vitality of the church, which would include the teaching and preaching ministries of the church. So we're suggesting that as part of the shepherd re shepherding responsibilities, the church leadership team um, oversee, ensure, and participate in these things to include the administration of church discipline. So that's the shepherding leadership responsibilities. And then when we talk about the strategic leadership responsibilities, we're talking about the senior leadership team being responsible for overseeing, ensuring, and participating in the ongoing implementation of these kind of things. The church's narrative, <coughs> excuse me, the church's strategic ministry plan and annual budget, the church's governing policies and bylaws, and the church's leadership development process. So we think the senior leadership, we're suggesting that the senior leadership team's strategic responsibilities, strategic leadership responsibilities would include these. And then finally, the third, so we had guidance, we had leadership, and the third primary responsibility that we want to suggest the senior leadership team be involved in is what we call accountability. And when we talk about accountability at the senior leadership team level, what we're suggesting to you is that your senior leadership team be responsible for all, uh, overseeing, ensuring, and participating the ongoing evaluation of these things. How is the implementation of the narrative, the strategic ministry plan, and the annual budget doing? How is the execution and compliance of the governing policies and bylaws going in the church? Accountability related to the execution of all of the shepherding leadership responsibilities, the, the accountability for how the ministry personnel's job performance is being evaluated and how they're doing, uh, as well as ensuring that the leadership development process is up and running in place. So these are, these are the accountability kind of responsibilities that we feel are important for the local church senior leadership to be involved in. So just to recap, what we're suggesting to you to consider today is that for your church, your, your church's situation, that the senior leadership team of your church, however it's structured, would be responsible for overseeing, ensuring, and participating in uh, the development of these things we've talked about the implementation and execution of the things we've talked about, and the evaluation of how they're going. So a guidance piece, strategic and shepherding leadership piece, and an, uh, an accountability piece for your senior leadership team. And as I said at the beginning of, that, of this segment, um, a number of these activities can be delegated out the tactical pieces and some of these other things can certainly be delegated out to other folks within the church. But we think that the senior leadership team owns the, is the um, primary responsibility agent for these things happening. Now before I jump into leadership development, I just want to pause and uh, give anyone an opportunity to ask any question they might have or to type in any question they might have. Good timing Anything there, Mike. Absolutely. Good timing, Keith. I guess um, most of us have the fire hose look and uh, it was a lot in a really quick amount of time. I wonder if um, you could just offer a, another really quick uh, recap of, of those three um, leadership 
ideas. Sure, like and I'll do that if, if folks don't mind me um, going backwards on the screen. Sure, and just, with, and just with, for everybody with, else too, I will also provide these slides in a PDF, so <laughs> you'll have those to review as well. Yeah, so just, Mike, just to summarize, um, this is our suggested framework for defining the responsibilities and functions of the senior leadership team of the local congregation, now, regardless of how that team is structured, whether it's a single board, a multiple board uh, structure. And it focuses on three particular key areas, the responsibility of guidance, the responsibility of leadership, and the responsibility of accountability. And the actions or the activities that the leadership team takes in those three areas is oversight, insurance, as well as participation in some of those. And so, um, you know, we'll, we'll make this available, but uh, we really think that these, the three on the left there, the what, are the key. And the one that we've seen uh, leadership teams um, and a number of churches have the most difficulty in is the one uh, at the bottom there, the accountability piece. And that's why we feel it's important to name it as a responsibility, to describe and define it, and then to assign it to the senior leadership team. Hope that was helpful, Mike. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move now through these. I apologize for moving through the slides like this, but I'm going to go through these to the next piece, which is uh, I want to talk, as we kind of close out our time, is that um, I want to talk a little bit about leadership development. And the reason I want to do that is because what we found is with these kind of responsibilities placed in, uh, within the confines of the senior leadership team, there's going to be training and equipping and knowledge transfer and things that are going to have to take place in an ongoing basis. And the, one of the best ways to do that is for a local church to put together, uh, develop and implement a, what we call a leadership development process. And let me share with you one of the churches we work with, how they defined for themselves the purpose of a leadership process at their church. They were saying that their leadership development process, the purpose of it is to continuously identify, equip, mobilize, and evaluate diverse leaders sufficient for the expanding work of God's kingdom in all ministries of the church. And the key here is that the leadership development process, whatever it is, however you define it, um, the key components are having a process, an intentional process in place that helps you identify who the leaders are based on particular criteria that you would define, equip them, mobilize them so have opportunities for them to actually lead, and then to come alongside them and evaluate how they're doing. And then just continuously having a pool of these folks and praying for additions that God would add to their numbers as the work of the kingdom expands there at the local church. So this is just an example of a purpose statement for leadership development that I think really encapsulates what leadership development is all about. The, and when we talk about um, who should be in these um, uh, leadership development process, we think at the very least um, the following folks should be engaged, or positions should be engaged in the ongoing leadership development. Your senior leadership board members or council members or whatever, they should be out front uh, engaged in the leadership development process. The lead pastor, if you have staff, whether they're part-time or full-time, your ministry team leaders, there should be some way for them to uh, enter into the leadership development process, your small group leaders, if you have small groups at your church, as well as any apprentice or emerging leaders. We think it's important that a development process um, be put in place that has pathways for each of these levels of leadership to enter into and to experience leadership development. And whatever process you design or implement, we would like to suggest to you <clears throat> that that process or those pathways should include each of what we call the four venues of learning and experience. These are four venues 
um, that, uh, of learning and experience to help provide training and equipping for existing and ex apprentice leaders. And let me just uh, walk you through these. Your, your leadership development pathways or processes for your leaders should include some resources and tools that uh, uh, the leader can use and refer to and be challenged by uh, when they're by themselves. So whether it's uh, web-based or um, whatever the materials are. Your leadership development should include some coaching, mentoring in a more relational context, so one-on-one, one-on-two. -on -one, one -on Your leadership development pathway process uh, we suggest it includes some small group leadership development training and uh, equipping, and that might mean that uh, every leadership meeting that you hold, you carve out some time for leadership development, or you just have a separate small group that is, you know, maybe every a couple of times a year, it's a small group training context that you use for leadership development and your leadership development process or pathways, we'd recommend they also include potentially exposing your leaders to some of the larger group gatherings like uh, whether it's Catalyst or the Global Summit or things like that. So whatever, you're, whatever you do, um, we would en encourage you as part of your leadership development to include these four venues of learning and experience. And your process should also include accountability mechanisms to ensure that everyone is on board who needs to be on board, everyone who enga is engaged who needs to be engaged, and everybody is progressing in their development as leaders or emerging leaders. So Mike, we've talked briefly about the need for support systems within the church just in general. We looked briefly at that tension that exists between the, or, or, the organism and the people of the uh, side of the church and the organizational realities of the church. We've talked about options for leadership structures. We looked at a suggested framework that we're recommending to you to describe leadership responsibilities. And we also talked just briefly at the end here, uh, a recommendation that each church create and implement a leadership development process for the leaders of the church. And in each one of those categories, Vision New England has been working with churches to help them discern, develop, and deploy these things. So that's it in a nutshell, Mike, and uh, I'll just turn it over to you now and see if there's any questions. Thanks, Keith. Um, as I wait for questions to be typed, uh, I had a quick one for you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about best practices and or uh, models that you've seen to bring about effective change in evaluation. Effective change in evaluation? In terms of if uh, somebody here today is listening and they kind of want to evaluate their leadership structure and, oh, yeah. and maybe yeah. even go about you know, bringing about change, what are some of those best practices? Sure. So um, what we would recommend is there's particular steps that you can take to evaluate how your current leadership structure is working. <clears throat> we happen to use the NCD survey because it touches on both uh, empowering leadership as well as effective structures for leadership. Um, and so that's the, that's the tool we use to get a snapshot. We also go in and have conversations with the leaders and with the congregation to see the kind of leadership that they're experiencing uh, and receiving. So uh, again, just in principle, any local church could uh, reach out to and uh, utilize some kind of tool that would assess it as well as conversations that would help assess it. And then um, best practices that we're seeing, I showed you the different board structures, so it's interesting that um, there is a lot of variety in New England around effective leadership structures. We, we would probably lean most towards a single structure at the senior leadership level. And then in terms of evaluating it, um, once you have a, a, a thorough understanding from a survey or an assessment tool and some conversations, um, you really need to begin at the biblical level, look at those responsibilities we talked about, and then see how you could implement in your current structure or a new structure the guidance, the leadership, and the accountability responsibilities. 
if your structure inhibits that, then I really think it's uh, you seriously need to take a look at it. Great. We have some questions coming in. Mike Olmsted asks, um, could you recommend any further readings or resources on this topic? Yeah, I'm, bi I'm biased here, so I would certainly recommend uh, Vision New England come and have a conversation with you. I'm sorry, I couldn't help Mike, but give you that plug. Um, I, I think that um, we we could add some value to that. Um, and what I'll do is I'll I'll give Mike um, some resources that he can post as part of the the uh, post webinar stuff. Some things that we've looked at. Um, couple, one thing that comes to, to mind is uh, Teams That Thrive, Warren Bird, um, ha has put together uh, some, some principles around Teams That Thrive that we've used and that we've found to be um, pretty accessible and pretty helpful, but we can make available those things. Absolutely. Um, Fred uh, Elliott Hart asks a good question. Um, from a leadership perspective that maybe has a primary responsibility of maintaining a ministry and putting out fires, what do you suggest as a good starting place to embrace the leadership responsibilities that you've outlined? Where, where should someone start, essentially, to share this framework of responsibility? Yeah, that, that's a great question, uh, Fred. Um, I think based on if I understand the correct the question correctly in inherent in that question is that there's a lot of fires going on and I think that one of the things that would have to take place before tweaking any leadership structure is really coming to terms with what are those fires and why do they keep coming so I would do some kind of uh, and I'm sure Fred's doing this but I, I would do some kind of assessment of what is going on, what lies behind these fires <clears throat> before I'd shift a structure, make a structural shift. Um, I'd want to know what's behind that, you know, how, how, what are the, the channels of communication, the channels of prioritization, the channels of leadership, um, the, po the processes that are involved. Um, I, I'd really want to uh, have a conversation with Fred or whoever to find out what lies behind that because it's very difficult if you're being pressed with all kinds of fires and demands it's very difficult to be able to see clearly the way forward without taking some time to assess where all that's coming from. And a quick follow-up question too, it, it sounds as though the council that Fred works with um, kind of struggles with the process of strategic planning and vision setting. Is there any um, processes or systems or even resources you could suggest to help them shepherd through the vision setting process? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we right now are working with a number of churches doing that exact same thing, vision casting and strategic ministry planning. So if Fred wants to shoot me a note, I'd be more than happy to just have a conversation with him off the line and kind of hear, hear what's going on there and s see if we might be able to point him in the right direction. So I'd be more than happy to help him with that because, again, that's something we're doing with a number of churches right now. Yeah, good stuff. I think that was it for the questions. Um, Keith, Great. thank you so much for your time. And really, I would also echo that further comment. If if you uh, today really didn't get a question asked or maybe can't type as fast as others, um, feel free to shoot Keith and or I uh, the questions you might have, and we could certainly get back to you and help you uh, as best we can for sure. Um, and just before we kind of close our day today, um, going to definitely pray for uh, all the churches represented here, but just wanted to highlight a couple of uh, key programs coming up in um, Vision New England's calendar. We're really excited to bring back Congress in a new way. Uh, it's going to be called the GO Conference, but it essentially is Congress Part 2. Um, we are going to have a large expo at the event. We'll have a uh, worship time that will be led through uh, by Unspoken, the, the current band, uh, Christian band. Uh, we'll also have uh, some large group communication and breakout communications as well. So look for more information on that on our webpage. We're hoping by December 1st to have all our registration process in place and you'll be able to get more information uh, about the conference as to who's speaking and what kind of breakouts we have. Um, we're also really excited to have a couple of uh, upcoming webinars. Our next scheduled webinar 
uh, is November 19th, and we're excited to have Linda Moore here, and she is the founder of By Design Ministries and also worked at Vision New England in terms of women's ministry development. So we're excited to have her share a little bit about some key ways that you can develop and create a, a vibrant women's ministry. Um, and also, um, we all just wanted to highlight our pastoral coaching network. We are starting up again for this current um, season, and we would love to have you participate. It's still not too late. Uh, they'll start up in November, and we have three locations this uh, term. We'll have a uh, network or a cohort in uh, Hartford. We'll have a cohort in Providence and a cohort in the Cape Cod area. So feel free to, again, go on our webpage and learn more information about that. And lastly, uh, we have a, a special webinar uh, next week, actually. We have a, a guest speaker, Neil Hudson. He is the Imagine um, Project Director at the London Instant Institute of Contemporary Christianity. Wow, it's a, a mouthful, but the topic should be fairly interesting. He's going to really uh, dig deep in terms of how you as a church and leadership uh, can really uh, shepherd and or grow and uh, encourage your regular attenders in the 21st century. Kind of what does that look like and what are the uh, structures and systems to put in place to really uh, help your regular attenders grow and, and uh, build disciples. So hopefully you'll be able to attend that and our next webinar and we're really excited that you took some time today and spent it with us. And thank you Keith again uh, for taking time and, and sharing what's on your heart and more leadership principles for us to think about. And lastly, we'll just end in prayer. Father God, we thank you uh, for what you're doing in our church. We thank you, Father God, that you've entrusted us uh, with being the leader and the shepherd and the guiding uh, hand in our church, Father God. And we pray that you would help us and encourage us to really think about um, our churches in new ways. Uh, help us to hear your word and your voice. Uh, help us to evaluate as we need, might need to evaluate or uh, plan. And Father God, we just pray that you would... Uh, Put your hands in every church represented here today, Father God, that you would help us to grow and be more effective for you and to share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you in your name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we'll see you next month, hopefully.